Welcome to the Create a Push, an intimate and diverse artist interview series. Here, artists and makers of all kinds share tips, advice, knowledge, and inspiration that you can learn from. I'm your host, Sherry O'Neill, a photographer, artist, writer, and educator. This series is a part of the Learn and Create platform to help artists further their education in creativity, art, and business. Today we have Phil Ponder, who is an architectural style watercolor painter. So Phil, you grew up in Ocala, Florida, which is also my hometown. Can you tell me about your childhood growing up in Ocala? What was that like? Ocala was a very unique place. When I I can first remember the city limits of Ocala was exactly four square miles. And then, of course, it, as it grew, it got bigger. It's, it's not, not a huge city now, but it was uh, one of those places uh, like Mayberry where you think, oh, you'll never leave here because it's so wonderful. There's just no place in the world like Ocala. My uh, father's uh, boss actually started the first horse farm in Ocala in 1938 called Rosemere. And now there's 200 of them. And a lot of the connection is with the uh, horse industry in uh, Kentucky. A lot of them go spend the winter down there in Ocala. It's a great place to raise and race horses. So what did your mom and dad do for a living? My father was uh, a bookkeeper. He was a very quiet person. He was older. Uh, so he was 49 when I was born. So he was kind of more like a grandfather to me than a father. Uh, my mother was a good bit younger. Um, she uh, actually was uh, into different things, uh, was a part owner in a beauty shop at one point, uh, was extremely interested in uh, civic organizations uh, and in her membership as a DAR, Daughters of American Revolution uh, member, uh, wound up uh, being uh, what they call the regent or the president. Uh, and at the time she passed away, she was the oldest DAR in the world, as far as we know. And your mother was, lived to be how old? My mother lived to be 112 years old. The day that she died, which was December the 31st of 2010, she was the oldest person in the state of Florida, the ninth oldest in the United States, and the 21st oldest in the world. My father's name was Lester William Ponder, and my mother's name, her full name, was Onizima Cecilia Chazelle Ponder. Wow, that's a that's a that's long a name. <laughs> and my brother is the William Carswell Ponder. And were your parents from Ocala originally, or did they? No, my my dad was actually born in a little town in uh, East Central Georgia called Louis, Louisville, and my mother was actually yeah she was born in Ocala. How did you start out and get into the arts? Was it part of your family life? Did you have any family members that were artists? The biggest artist in my life was my mother. She was very creative. She loved to do different kinds of art. Uh, she, I think she'd always appreciate it from the time that she was a little girl. She liked to do th creative things like uh, ceramics and even uh, rug hooking. Uh, so she, she did also oils and uh, watercolors. And she always encouraged me to appreciate the different arts. And that's why um, I've still got my little coloring book from the first grade, uh, which shows that I stayed mostly in the line. So I think she felt like I had some kind of uh, mm, talent that I could use somewhere down the line. When I was in high school, she encouraged me to take some lessons from a lady named Susan Carmichael. And the Carmichaels actually owned Silver Springs, which, of course, is right near where we grew up. She had gone to the Chicago Institute of Art, was a very accomplished artist in her own right, and was able to share some of those basic artistic uh, knowledge. And that was it. I didn't do that much with it for years. You did a lot of artwork growing up? Were you... Were you I did, uh, you know, a, a fair amount. I dated a, a girl when I was a freshman, and she was a really good artist. Um, and so she had kind of encouraged me, and I remember she kind of got me to do um, like a book cover for a, one of the stories we had to read in English class. So that was one of the early projects uh, that I did. When you got out of high school, 
Did you go off to college? I went to college. I actually went to uh, Florida State after two years. And, uh, of course, at that point, I was uh, engaged to my wife and decided, you know, I would be closer on the weekend. So I switched over to the University of Florida and at the same time was able to work in the little shoe store on Saturday. Shoe store was in, uh, on the square in downtown. It's called Jordan's Shoe Store. And the products he had in there, the shoes he had, were mostly from General Shoe Company, which in 1959 became Genesco. They changed the name to Genesco. So you got your degree? Got my degree from the University of Florida in, uh, in actually industrial management uh, segment of business administration. Of course, I was subject to uh, going into the military. At the last minute, an invitation to go to Officer Canada School in Newport, Rhode Island for the Navy. So I accepted that. Then after that, I got married, and then we moved to Charleston, and then my ship was uh, deployed down to Guantanamo Bay for a, a month of training. We moved here uh, June the 1st, 1959, and started work with Genesco, which I had been negotiating with for several months to come up here. And my wife was expecting our second child. We had one while we were in the Navy, our oldest daughter, uh, Terry. During all of that time, were you doing any kind of artwork at all? For several years there, I'd only do something just for fun. It was just a hobby. And finally, in 1976, I did something for each of our children for their Christmas present. Uh, three of those happened, to the uh, four that I did, happened to involve buildings. So that's what kind of got me interested in doing buildings. And the next year I happened to notice this um, picture on the wall at Genesco. It was of a little Italian village called San Gimiano. The picture did not have sky in it and did not have any land underneath it. It was a, a wall city, so it showed the wall and the church towers and the made an interesting little picture and a little concept that I adopted when I had this idea of doing Market Street downtown. I knew I had the idea of doing something without sky or land, and that's what I did. The 20 buildings on Market Street and the sidewalk actually was the only thing that connected them. There was no street in it, and that's what got me started. I did that first uh, picture with an old dip pen uh, India ink, those little gooseneck bottles with an India ink pen, and uh, then did watercolor over the top of it. And you know, I worked on it for virtually the whole year. Didn't realize what I was getting into because I was doing this just as more of an experiment to see what I could do with the artwork. And then, by, by good fortune, I had given this to a friend of ours to frame who had a home framing business. And he says, I can't do this because this is so big, it's going to take oversized mats. So he referred me to Reed's Frame Shop in Madison because he knew that they had the equipment to frame something that was an unusual size. I went to Reed's and um, worked out the details on what mats we wanted to put on the framing. And along came a guy named Charles Wallace. He was a friend of the Reed family. And he sold prints at a shop where he worked. He saw my original there, but he says, you have got to have prints made of this. I sell prints where I work, and this would be an ideal print, this long picture of the 20 buildings on Market Street. And I said, oh, well, I don't think so. And this was one of your very first This was the first, first picture that I'd really done. And had no idea what was going to happen from there. I wouldn't be talking to you today if Charles Wallace had not come along. Finally, just to kind of get him off my back, I said, okay, we'll do this. If, you, if you'll help me get started on this. He went with me to a friend of his who was in the printing business. His name was Daniel Boone, who I wound up working with for the next 35 years. I retired in uh, uh, 89 from Genesco, and then I segued into the artwork. Uh, and it was just a natural for me, uh, since I had it as a hobby. But I'd only been doing maybe one picture a year, because I was on a plane most every week going somewhere. I had a lot of duties all around the country, and it was not much time for artwork. So in the 80s, you started full-time pretty much painting? Yeah, well, I actually started in 89. The first year, I did several different pictures. 
and we were doing uh, prints of those. Um, I, I was, in those days, prints were very popular, and I got on this little niche of doing historic buildings in Nashville, and people appreciated that. But what I do is to make it an original of mine, I go and I take a lot of photographs. I mean, if I was taking uh, a building, I'd probably be taking 20 to 30 uh, shots uh, from different angles. Uh, basically, I do the facade, the front of the building. Um, recently, I've been doing a little bit of, of the what I call three-quarter view, but mostly it's still just dead on to the building. So what I do is more of an architectural nature. It's like a blueprint of the building, except it's very colorful. And um, I, I try to put something in the picture that gives it the spirit of the building. And I'm not talking about that kind of spirit. I'm talking about the building itself has kind of a feeling. And that's why I want to go to that building. I want to go inside. I want to get the, the kind of the the feeling that you get that's special about that building and why it's been able to retain its importance for all these years. Uh, when I get the photographs, I, I lay them out on this work table and then I kind of formulate in my mind what I want to do and I make a rough sketch and then I use my calculator, which you won't run into many artists that use a calculator, to make sure that I've got my size worked out and balanced out and so forth. So it's a lot of just interplay with my mind and, and translating what I've got envisioned, envisioned in my mind down to paper. And how did you learn to use the calculator? To it, it's scale? mostly self-taught. I have a mathematical background. I think I, I took every math course I could in high school. So I, I kind of incorporated that appreciation for math into what I do with buildings because, you know, when I'm doing the details on a building, if it's brick, I count every brick. This drives people crazy, I know, but I, I actually count the bricks, and that's why I'm doing a an architectural history of that, on paper, of that building as accurate as I possibly can be. So you start with pencil. I start with pencil. Do you have a kind of a standard size that you're... Writing? Well, if it, it depends on what it is. If it's the skyline, they are 14 by 30 inches. That's the size of the paper. I use what's called a 500-pound paperweight. It's made in France. It's a lot of cotton in it, and so it's really high quality, and that's what I want. I want to make sure I've, I use high-quality products. That's the way. That's my objective is to have a quality product that people will appreciate, and it will serve as a memory to, to them of, as I say, a, a very special site, location, yeah, event. Exactly. And do you start in the middle and work your way out? Is there a certain... I kind of envision the whole picture in my mind, and I start uh, probably at the bottom and then kind of build up. And then I use my calculator to figure out the size of each of the buildings. I kind of build up from there. It's a little bit different process if I'm doing just one building. If I'm doing somebody's house or church or school, I kind of block off and you know, see where the center line is. If at all possible, I like to have the front door of the structure right in the middle of the, of the picture. Hey guys, thanks for listening. I hope you're enjoying the creative push. These artist interviews are a labor of love, but it sure would help if you'd consider supporting this podcast with a small monthly donation to help sustain the work and time it takes for me to produce future episodes. You can click the support button or you can click the link below in the show notes. Any support is greatly appreciated and you can cancel at any time. Either way, I'm glad to have you here. Please subscribe and share. Now let's get back to the show. So how many paintings do you think you've done since you started in, I guess, 89? That's a wonderful question. Uh, I had no idea until I started working with uh, Matt Fisher and Dwayne Chambers on the book that we did this last year. It was somewhere around 700 images that I've done uh, since 1979. Everything was just perfect to introduce the book last year. We were coming out of COVID. Uh, coming out of a year where people were not able to get out much. We had uh, some special events where we introduced the book, and it just went, just a dream introduction. Matt was the uh, not only the instigator, but he actually worked pulling information together. So, And, and then Dwayne, who is a, a 
technical guru when it comes to digital stuff. He put it all together. So were both of these gentlemen kind of acting sort of as a rep for you? They did all those uh, jobs uh, to pull this all together for the books. Commissioned work, were you finding that on your own? What I do is when somebody says, uh, would you do my building? Would, would you do the uh, Johnny Cash Museum, which is one of the the projects for next year. I said, sure, I'll put you down on the list and you know, when your name comes up, I'll call you and if you still want to do the project, fine. No obligation. I go on to the next person that I have on the list and say, are you ready to do it? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, let's go make some pictures. We'll talk about the details, what size you want. Recently, you have some news of so how your artwork is going to be used are the area that was bombed in downtown Nashville. Down on, is it 2nd Avenue? 2nd Avenue. It, it's exciting news, actually. Uh, this is going to be the biggest project that my art has ever been involved in. Several months ago, one of the architects who was uh, employed to uh, assist with revitalizing 2nd Avenue after the bomb of uh, a little over a year ago, um, came to me and said, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about maybe using your art. We don't know exactly what we're going to do. So a couple of months went by and they finally came to me and they said, okay, we got all worked out. The AT&T is on board. What we're going to do, we're going to encase the AT&T building in aluminum sheeting. Now, this accomplishes several things. First of all, it covers up the black smudge left from the bomb. It also updates the look on the building, which is just sheer red brick all the way up with no windows. We're going to put your artwork on the building, life-size, as a mirror image from what used to be across the street before the bomb. That's amazing. So this is going to be etched into the aluminum sheeting. So tell us about the bird. That is actually something I wanted to ask you about. So in every, is it every one of your paintings? Every one of the paintings, except one little picture I did up in Cades Cove one time. I forgot to put it on there. But anyway, basically all the pictures have my little bird in there. Now, it started in 1980. I did the picture of Silver Dollar Saloon. And on the upper right-hand corner on the roof was a pigeon. And I said, you know what? That's really interesting, that little pigeon sitting up there. This was the fourth thing I'd ever done. I'm going to put that in the picture see if anybody notices it. So I put the pigeon on the corner of the building, and a lot of people came by and said, Oh, I like your little friend, your little bird. That's, that's, and then I thought, Oh, my goodness, if people like it, then I'm going to put that little bird to work for me. So he became my Waldo. You know, where's Waldo? And so I put him in. Every, he's flown all over the place. And he, he went without a name for 30 some years. And finally, I made the connection with a friend of ours. Her name was Happy Birdsong. Now, how in the world did it take me so long to figure that out? So my little bird's name, Happy. You kind of hide him in your paintings. I, I, I didn't make him very obvious, but he's there. He's a gray blue pigeon. So in every one of your images that are in your book, Happy is in... Happy's in the picture. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. Starting out as an artist, what do you feel like was your biggest failure, or were there any failures? I'm very fortunate. I'm very blessed in what, what happened. If I would say anything was a failure, was that I didn't start soon enough. I wasn't trying to promote myself uh, because I had a full-time job and never dreamed that I'd be doing artwork as a, quote, second career. Never dreamed that. With encouragement from a lot of people, this seemed like a natural segue into the artwork since it had been a hobby for nine years, and uh, it worked. How did you know how to price your art? I didn't. I priced it too low, and, and I still like I keep, keep my art in a very modest range. I, I don't purposely, uh, because I want people to enjoy it, and I want people to be able to afford to buy it. When I'm doing your commission work, I'll tell people, I'll give them an estimate, and I said, this is going based on many, how many hours it takes me. And how many hours does it normally take for the average piece? The average piece probably takes uh, 45, 50 hours in that neighborhood. You know, when I do a skyline, 
those take me, you know, weeks and probably closer to 80 to 100 hours because there's 200 buildings. And when you do that and you price it, do you price it kind of like at, by an hourly fee? I do. So if you were to give advice to any other artists, is that the best way to kind of think about your art is from an hourly standpoint? I, I think it's the best way to start. How much are you worth? How much? I mean, are you worth $100 an hour? If you really think nice of yourself, you know, you start probably start at that price. I don't charge that much. God created all these things from scratch, and I'm just the guy that, that paints them on paper. It's such a blessing I'm still able to do this at, at 89 years old. Did you have any artistic influence when you started out on this path? Well, the influence I had, that picture that I talked about at Genesco, that really set the tone for what I still do now, as far as no sky, no land, and just concentrating on the subject himself and using architectural parallels that I, I use for the structures uh, that, as I paint them. What does creativity mean to you? Creativity means that I was able to take a, a subject and add this spirit that I've talked about earlier to the subject and translate that down to paper. So w that when people look at that, they say, whoa, that is just the way I remember it. And that's what I want. Is that also motivate you to want to create? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's always something that I can do art-wise. And what's your biggest struggle? Finding enough time to do what uh, I want to do. What do you see in your future? I want to continue as uh, doing artwork uh, as long as I'm physically able to. Is there anything you'd like to learn that you haven't learned yet? Oh, there's, there's a lot. Uh, you know, I, I think I would like to learn um, some more appreciation of why the uh, masters of art, you know, the El Greco's and the Rembrandt's and so forth, of what inspired them and what made them famous and techniques. And how do you market your work? Mostly through Picture This Gallery. Pictures that are sold through the gift shops at the Hermitage and the Parthenon. And there's a, a few other uh, accounts we have. They sell prints. They, they sell prints. I do the originals, and then we have prints made at Lithographics. Or if it's a small run, then we can do them in-house at Picture This Gallery. But there, you know, you can go there at any one time, and you can see virtually everything that I have to offer is available uh, at that one location. And then you sell the original. I, I can sell the original, and of course, if it's a commission, then the, the person that commissioned me to do it is one that, that, that buys it. And he, sometimes that individual has a, a few prints made for their family members. Uh, otherwise, if, if they don't, then they, it's an original and it goes on their wall in their living room, and that's it. And, and then do you also sell postcards? We have uh, small cards. And then you've got your book for sale now. The book has been fantastic. I'm so glad we did it last year. I saw a puzzle on your table. We did. Do you do puzzles? Yeah. We did one puzzle this past year, and we did a, a poster. And these were all actually byproducts of doing the book. The book was kind of the, the catalyst for these other elements. And doing the, the puzzle, the puzzles went amazingly well with a puzzle. I was surprised how many we sold. That's, That's great. What advice can you offer to someone who's starting out on their own creative path as an artist? Come talk to me first. Uh, I think that uh, uh, with my experience, I can give them some pointers on what to do because, you know, I started with nothing. I had no accounts except for Charles Wallace talking me into having the first print made and him actually going up and down Market Street to sell a few of the prints. And then he went to the newspaper and he got Clara Hermonymous to write an article about it for a Sunday edition. And that's what really got me started. So I'm so indebted to him still. Latch on to somebody, if you can, that's got a connection in the, in the industry. Go talk to Matt Fisher or, or the current owner, who is Brian Ledford at uh, uh, Picture This Gallery. Find out what, what makes them want to sell your product. And so people can find your work at Picture This Gallery. You can go online and find it there. It's, a, the complete, it's completely online. You just go to philponder.com and that'll take you uh, there eventually. Do you ever think that you would go to Ocala and paint 
something from their downtown or something iconic of Ocala, of your hometown? Well, I've done a couple of things down there. Uh, the gazebo on the, the uh, courthouse square, I've done that. There's some things in Ocala that would be interesting to do still. Uh, some of the old homes there. Uh, there was a place on um, Silver Spring Boulevard called 1890 House. I don't remember that. Um, that would be a, an interesting home to do. Well, Phil, thank you so much for doing this podcast with me. My pleasure. It was so much fun to get to know you, and I love your story, and I love your work. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for listening. As always, my intention is to offer inspiration that excites you to want to get out there and create something amazing. Be sure to check out some of the other episodes. There's more information below in the show notes, including links to other great stories, tips, and resources. Drop me a message or comment at any time, and I hope that you'll sign up to be a part of this creative tribe.